Thank you, Meg. Appreciate that. Well, it's very good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but um, Cuba is not a free society. <laughs> but let me tell you, Cuba is an absolutely fascinating place. Uh, the culture is incredible, the music, the food, uh, the dance, the art, uh, and, and just the sense of life of the people there um, is second to none anywhere in the world. And it's just unfortunate that they uh, live in this um, environment. Okay, there's the entrance to Havana Harbor, the cathedral, old Havana, um, that, that uh, building there with the flags is, was Hemingway's favorite hotel. Uh, you can go see the room that he was always, that he always stayed in if you, if you want to, all uh, uh, furnished in the way that it was back then. Beautiful, you know, the, the architecture at Old Havana there to a large extent is um, Moorish, you know, with these beautiful uh, in, inner courtyards, absolutely stunning. Uh, the, it's, you know, no accident that uh, a lot of uh, architects take people uh, to, uh, to Havana. Havana was a very rich city. Uh, Cuba was a relatively rich country uh, prior to the socialist period, um, behind you know, Argentina, Uruguay, um, but pretty much, uh, other than that, uh, the richest country in Latin America and the Caribbean. A lot of these 1950s era cars, Cubans are allowed to, to own these cars. They could buy a car as long as it was a car that was there prior to the triumph of the revolution. So that's why you, you see a lot of these 1950s era cars. And um, <clears throat> I, used to, I, I taught a course of the Cuban economy that included a trip to Havana um, over spring break. And I taught that course from 1999 to 04. And then I switched to a course on the post-socialist economies of Europe. And it wasn't for another 10 years that I came back to Cuba uh, to teach the, uh, this course when I came to the Citadel. And one of the first things I noticed is that there were a lot more of these 1950-era cars. How could there be more of them after 10 years? The reason is because the state permits individuals to sell their services to tourists as drivers. And the guy who owns that car drives tourists around and could probably make in one night triple the average salary for a state worker in a month. So that's quite an incentive to discover old heaps and rehabilitate them and put them on the streets. This is El Floridita, classic, classic bar. This was Hemingway's one of Hemingway's favorite bars. It was where he went to drink his daiquiris. And uh, you can't see it in this picture, but at the end of the bar, there's a life-size bronze of Hemingway sitting at a bar stool. So you can go there and sit next to Hemingway and have a daiquiri. Pictures I just showed you are, for the most part, five, six square blocks at Old Havana. The rest of the city, well over a million people, looks like this. That's the real Havana. I took that from the roof of my hotel. That hotel was situated right, in, right next to Old Havana, uh, one block away from El Prado, which is a big um, boulevard, probably the top location uh, for any normal city. You'll see the ocean there. Uh, so what we're doing is we're looking out past those buildings there uh, to what, what's right below there is the Malacón. Malacón is a 12-kilometer stretch of, of seawall and the boulevard that just runs along the north um, part of town. Uh, that's a collapsed building. There's something like three building collapses per day in Havana alone. And uh, a few years ago, uh, we were driving along with my students in a bus and a building collapsed right there as we were driving by. Uh, all these pictures here, uh, or, or several pictures I'm about to show you, were taken from uh, the balcony of my hotel. This is how the people live, for the most part. That you can see the, you know, the railing in my balcony here. 
uh, looking down at the street, you know, look at those buildings. Those are 19th century buildings that they were once really beautiful. And, you know, with a little imagination, they still are. But they haven't been maintained. And so they're falling apart. And they're collapsing. But look at the beauty. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. That's why architects take students to Havana. Typical wiring you see all over the city. Probably wouldn't pass uh, fire codes in, <laughs> in Charleston. Um, anybody have any idea what that is? What? It's a ration, it's a ration card. card. It's a ration card. Every month you take this to a ration store, you can pick up um, dried beans and rice and coffee and, and cooking oil and sugar. Um, and it should last you about one week. If you're lucky. Then, well, what do you do the other three weeks before you can go again? Because this is a you know, monthly ration. Well, you have to buy at private markets for prices that most people cannot afford unless they have access to dollars, like they have a relative in Miami that sends them money, um, or they are in the private sector, like that guy who drives that Ford Fairlane uh, that I showed you a few minutes ago. This is a, an agricultural market. Plays a big role in Cuban socialist history. Um, they go back and forth on these agricultural markets. They outlaw them, then they authorize them, and they outlaw them, then they authorize them. Right now, uh, they're legal. <laughs> Anybody know what that is? This, this is how this guy makes his money. <laughs> He's got this, I guess that's a chihuahua, and his pet rat. And the rat rides the chihuahua, and tourists go, ooh, ah, they want to take pictures. And when you take a picture, he puts his hand out, and you're supposed to put a little money in there. Uh, he probably makes a pretty good living. OK, so Cuba is a planned socialist economy, a planned socialist economy. What, what differentiates a socialist economy from a capitalist economy? What's the big thing? Ownership of what? Capital, land, non-labor factors of production. Non-labor factors of production. All right, so all the land, all the capital, and the you know, fully implemented planned socialist economy is owned by the state. Whereas in a capitalist economy, they're owned by us, private sector, individuals. Okay? And in a socialist economy, they're owned by the state. Now, what makes this version of socialism planned socialism is that every productive enterprise, every factory, every farm, every retail outlet, they all have one owner, the state. They're all simply part of the state. They're state agencies. Right? And they're planned. Every year, at least in the fully implemented planned socialist economy, you'll see why I say that, fully implemented uh, in a moment, every establishment, every steel factory, every farm, every power generating company, every retail establishment, receives a plan at the beginning of the year. That plan tells it exactly what it will do, what it will produce, what resources it will use to produce those things, what prices it will get for its outputs, and what prices it will pay for its inputs. Everything, right down to the most minute detail, is contained in the annual plan. And they're not supposed to deviate from that plan. Right? So what coordinates all economic activity is this plan. Every single entity that produces any good or any service receives at the beginning of the year. Okay? Highly centralized decision making. 
private entrepreneurship is absent in a fully implemented uh, planned socialist economy. So what countries besides Cuba are we talking about? Does anybody know? <laughs> North Korea is a planned socialist economy. All right? Pretty much the only planned socialist economy today are North Korea and Cuba. What about the past? Soviet Union, Maoist China, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria. There's another version of socialism as an aside. Anybody know what that's called? It's called market socialism. Right? In a market socialist economy, all the land and capital is owned by the state, but each individual enterprise makes its own decisions. They don't receive a plan. They decide for themselves what to do. And they receive an income for what they sell, out of which they have to pay their costs, and then whatever is left over, they distribute to the workers. So it's a much freer kind of a version of socialism. Does anybody know where, does anybody, can anybody tell me a market socialist economy? There was only one, Yugoslavia, the only place that's ever been implemented. Okay? What's Sweden? Sweden is out and out capitalist. Capitalist economy. It's a lot of redistribution of income, but otherwise it is a capitalist economy because it's based on private ownership of the law and labor factors of production as well as labor, um, and uh, individual decision making in a market setting. Okay? So Cuba is a planned socialist economy. The economic goals of, of uh, the Cuban Revolution. Again, the, the revolution occurred over much of the 1950s and triumphed as their, their troops rolled into Havana on January 1st, 1959. Batista had fled um, the night before. They wanted to achieve rapid economic growth. In the 1950s is a period of somewhat, you know, stagnant growth. Um, all planned socialist economies want to achieve rapid economic growth because they see this as a signal that they're superior to capitalism, right? that they can outgrow the capitalist world. And this is a theme that you see over and over and over again in Maoist China, in the Soviet Union. They all want to outgrow the capitalist world. They want to achieve rapid economic growth. Cuba is no different in that regard. They want to reduce their dependency on sugar through rapid industrialization and the diversification of agriculture. Diversification of agriculture is fine. What about the rapid industrialization? Cuba is an agricultural island with virtually no resources. <laughs> it is the last place where you would expect to find industrialization. Again, they share this with all planned socialist economy. This is ideological. This is the ideology of socialism. They all want to industrialize. And it doesn't matter what their comparative advantage is, they want to industrialize. So if you travel through a plan, all the, the planned socialist world, as I did back in the day, all these countries look the same. Their economies were almost identical because they were allocating resources on the basis of this ideologically driven need to, uh, to, to prioritize heavy industry and construction. Okay? So they want to reduce their dependency on Cuba. Cuba was a one crop economy, basically. Sugar. It had been for centuries. All right? This is one of the prime uh, uh, sources of sugar, world sources of sugar. And they, um, you know, what, if, if, you, you, sugar is a commodity, right? You don't want your economy based on a commodity because over time the terms of trade invariably run against you, right? And Cuba has been suffering this problem of being a commodity-based economy with the terms of trade running against it for a long, long time. So they wanted to diversify their economy away from sugar. 
uh, reduced the, uh, economic dependency on the U.S. Almost all of Cuba's trade was with the U.S. Almost all the sugar that Cuba produced went to the U.S. Okay? They wanted to reduce their dependency on this one trading partner. Do you think they probably achieved that goal? Uh, they want to achieve full employment. There's a lot of unemployment, uh, particularly in the countryside, very, very large amount of uh, uh, rural unemployment, but also um, you know, uneducated uh, urban population that was unemployed. Uh, they wanted to redistribute income more equally. Well, this is, you know, a common socialist goal is to redistribute income. There's a, there's a lot of really rich people and a lot of really poor people in, in Cuba. They w increase the living standard of the peasantry and skilled urban uh, workers. Okay, I'm going to use this uh, graph here and, and that one to kind of t organize the story I'm going to tell you about the implementation of socialism in, in Cuba. So, 1959, triumph of the revolution. Okay? Um, for the first decade, a little bit more than a decade, 1959 to 1970, 71, uh, this was a period of chaos. This was a period of chaos. For the first couple of years, nobody even knew what kind of a revolution this was. Fidel Castro does not announce the socialist character of the revolution until 1961. All anybody knows is that what this revolution is all about is destroying markets. All right? So massive um, nationalization of industry, particularly a bunch of oil refineries um, near uh, Havana, on the other side of Havana Harbor from Old Town. Okay? Um, farms, the largest farms, are nationalized, okay? Um, and um, a lot of professionals, a lot of doctors, lawyers, accountants, the professionals of Cuba are driven away. Right? There's this massive immigration to the U.S., okay? Um, after the um, uh, announcement that this is a socialist revolution, two years in, uh, they, they attempt to set up the planning apparatus of a planned socialist economy. There's one problem with this. They have no expertise. Nobody knows how to do it. Not only that, but Fidel hates experts. <laughs> he only likes revolutionaries. They're the only people he trusts. He doesn't trust people who know how to manage a planned socialist economy. So they're trying to set up the planning apparatus. They're trying to plan, and Fidel keeps overruling everything they say. So a couple more years of, of chaos. Uh, and, and then, um, and, and you see what's happening to the economy. It's shrinking. Right? It's shrinking. Um, then there's this big debate. Who, who in Cuba at this time is in charge of industry? Right, they're trying to industrialize. Who's in charge? Who's the Ministry of Industry? Anybody know? Che. Che Guevara. What's Che Guevara's background? Medicine. He knows nothing about industry. You know what his other position is? He's president of the central bank. And he doesn't believe in money. He doesn't believe in money. Che Guevara is a radical Maoist. He wants to institute a great leap forward in Cuba. So there's this big debate going on during this period between Che Guevara on one hand and the people who are trying to set up a, a planning structure along the lines of the Soviet Union, where there is a recognition that, hey, this is socialism, right? Under socialism, workers, enterprise managers, respond to incentives. You've got to give them incentives. 
All right, so you've got, diff, you know, you've got pay scales that, that reflect position. You have bonuses that reward success. Right? Che Guevara wants to do away with all that. He wants to take away all wages. Nobody will receive any wage. No material incentives whatsoever. They just go to canteens and eat lunch and dinner that's prepared for them and wear the clothes that are handed out to them. All right, live in barracks. That's what he wants. All right? He is in charge of industry. The, the, the other group that are more influenced by uh, the socialist debate in the Soviet Union, uh, they manage the uh, agricultural sector, which fortunately for them back then is the, the dominant part of the economy at that point, sugar. Okay? Um, but then after a couple of years of this fighting between these different sectors, uh, starting in 1967-ish, um, the Guevaras win the debate. And the whole economy is organized along Maoist lines. How successful was the Great Leap Forward in China? It killed a lot of people. It killed a lot of people. Millions and millions and millions of people starved because of the lack of incentive. Nobody had an incentive to do anything. Uh, this is the Great Leap Forward in, in Cuba. Uh, now, you know, I'd rather be in Cuba where, you know, <laughs> if you're hungry, you can throw a fishing line into the water <laughs> or pick up an orange on an orange tree, but, um, but it, it wasn't very successful. It wasn't very successful. So, uh, by 1970, after more than a decade of the socialist revolution, or what would eventually be identified as a socialist revolution, uh, the economy is smaller than it was uh, at the, uh, 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 before the triumph of the revolution, okay? Uh, they, they throw up their hands. Oh, and by the way, the Soviet Union is really irritated because Che Guevara has been running around and everybody else there, Fidel, running around saying that um, the Soviet Union is inferior to Cuba. Cuba is well advanced, the Soviet Union, on the road to communism. And communism, by the way, is that state of the economy where um, socialism has made the whole productive enterprise so efficient that uh, it, 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 it eliminates scarcity. So much is produced that everybody is consuming all they could possibly want. Therefore, and furthermore, the development of society has reached the point where people no longer are motivated through material means. All they care about is what's good for everybody else. Um, and so uh, there is no longer a need for plans. There's no longer a need for the state. The state withers away. Not exactly um, what Cuba was, but anyway, um, the Soviet Union is pretty irritated at Cuba uh, for, for, for all this. And they start, they, they, they reduce their shipments of oil to, uh, to Cuba uh, in retaliation. So that's part of that story as well. In 1970, um, they, they, the Cubans throw up their arms and say, okay, Soviet Union, you're right. Uh, we have to institutionalize socialism uh, in order to make the economy productive enough to make this transition to communism. You come, please tell us how to do it. So the Soviet Union sends a whole bunch of experts uh, to Cuba to set up a planning structure. And they more or less do it. They never actually come up with a comprehensive plan for Cuba. It's sort of more like you know, sectoral plans that aren't well connected. But still, it's a lot better than they had before. And they bring, reintroduce material incentives, just like they have in the Soviet Union with bonuses and pay scales and things like that. And uh, Cuba enters a fairly long period of fairly decent economic growth. This is the good times for, uh, for Cuba. A little, um, little hiccup in the late 70s. Um, and coming out of that, growth is quite a bit slower. Um, 
you get into the early 80s and things are kind of slowing down and Fidel is getting fed up with this. <coughs> he doesn't like this. And um, by the mid 80s, the economy is stagnant. Now, um, where else was it stagnant? What, what other economy was stagnant by the mid 80s? Soviet Union. <laughs> It wasn't working a whole lot better in the Soviet Union than it was working in Cuba, but at least Soviet Union was this enormous country which is uh, arguably the resource richest country in the whole world with well, gas and, and, and coal and oil and diamonds and every metal you can think of and every, everything you can think of. Cuba's got nothing. It's got a little bit of nickel. That's about it. Virtually no oil at all. Okay? It's got sugar. It's got the right kind of climate and soil conditions to grow sugarcane. Okay, that's pretty much its only resource. Um, they reverse course again in 1985, dismantling the planning structure, uh, making decisions arbitrarily about investments, you know, new capital and that kind of stuff. Um, and, um, and so they go into this period of what they call the period of rectification of past errors and tendencies, the so-called rectification period. All right. The rectification period obviously is not a success. They don't turn the economy around. It continues to shrink. And then what happens? The socialist world collapses. It disappears on them. It goes away. Starting with the fall of Berlin Wall in 1989, and then finally at the end of 1991, the Soviet Union is no longer. And the Soviet Union and all those Soviet bloc countries of Europe are no longer trading with Cuba. Cuba loses pretty much its whole export market. It's gone. 85% of Cuba's international trade was with the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc countries of Europe. It's gone. They won't trade with Cuba anymore. They don't have anything to do with them. Okay? So Cuba enters in a period of collapse where it loses well over a third of its economy. Okay? Um, this, is, this continues that story. I'm using a slightly different format rather than simply charting per capita gross domestic product. I'm charting changes in per capita gross domestic product. But it's really the same story. I'm organizing it this way because it's a little bit easier to tell the story. Um, so the, the first few years is the last few years in that last chart. This is the collapse. And you can see what that collapse was. All right? uh, the 1990, the economy shrinks by almost 3%. The following year, by almost 11%. The year after that, by almost 12%. The year after that, 15%. People are literally starving. Starvation might be a bit extreme, but there is clearly um, stunting of growth. Children's growth is stunted. Uh, the average adult loses about 20 pounds. Um, and it, you know, this, is a, this is a pretty bad time. Again, you know, you're hungry, you throw a fishing line in the water. Uh, so it can't be that bad, but, but it's, it's really bad. All right? Why is this? Because Nobody is buying anything from Cuba. <laughs> and they really don't have any other industry. It's a one-crop economy. Right? And they're losing it. So they've got to do something fast to stop this free fall of their economy. So starting in this period where the uh, economy is uh, falling like this, um, they, they institute a series of what, for lack of a better word, uh, reforms. And the, the, the idea here is to create a private sector within what is otherwise a socialist economy. So it's a kind of like a dual economy structure where you've got um, the, the old socialist system um, taking care of the commanding heights, industry, uh, most of agriculture, but you permit the small emerging sector that, um, that operates along market lines. Okay? 
Um, and the idea is they know that they are a socialist economy and they see if it, capitalism and they have to somehow work their way in. Okay? They have to have something to offer the world uh, to stop this free fall. Now, what, was, what do you th suppose is the first thing that came to their minds? Tourism. Tourism. They had essentially no tourist industry um, prior to this. Some Russians would come, and there would be some very, very poor hotels that they would stay in. For the most part, there was, there was no real uh, tourist industry. So they're going to ramp up tourism as a way to generate foreign currency into their economy. Right? Ironically, they dollarize the economy. The US dollar becomes legal tender. And it's part of this dual economy uh, model where the socialist sector operates in the domestic Cuban peso, which is not a convertible currency, and the emerging sector operates in dollars. So as a tourist, you go over there, you stay in a hotel, you eat at a restaurant, and you pay with US dollars. Okay? And if you are a Cuban and you've run out of food from your monthly ration, you go into the private agricultural markets and you pay um, in dollars. Or you go to a store, if you have to you know, pick up an appliance, buy an appliance or something like that, you have to pay in dollars. Which is, most Cubans don't have. They, they, they encourage foreign investment into Cuba. They're trying to get foreign firms to come in and open up operations. Now, uh, what do you suppose is the most common foreign investment in Cuba? Hotels. So, the, for instance, the Spanish um, hotel chain, Melia, comes in and um, builds hotels. Right? Um, sometimes as a joint enterprise, the way joint enterprises work is the Cuban side says, okay, well, um, we're going to own 51%, you're going to own 49%. That was typical. Um, and, and our contribution in exchange for the 51% ownership is, you see that building over there is falling down? Well, you get to fix that up at your expense. Um, the Habana Libre Hotel. Right? Habana Libre was the old Havana Hilton. At the beginning of the uh, revolution, uh, Fidel made his headquarters at the Havana Libre Hotel. Right? That was managed by a Spanish hotel company. Right? And not as a joint enterprise, but that was a management contract. So Cuba maintained ownership of Havana Libre. The Spanish firm had a contract to run it. But in order to have that contract to run it, they had to renovate it at enormous expense. So those are the, kind of the tip, typical kinds of foreign investments, either joint enterprises uh, or management contracts. Right? So the, and initially there was a, you know, a flurry of interest, uh, particularly the tourist industry, uh, but what they soon discovered is it was really hard to make a profit. It was really hard to make a profit. For one thing, you had very little control over your labor. In fact, you had pretty much no control over your labor. The way these joint enterprises work is a foreign investor is not permitted to employ a Cuban. Wait a minute. You're running a hotel and you can't employ a Cuban. What you have to do is you have to enter into a relationship with a Cuban entity that employs the worker. And will charge you, the foreign investor, on average $500 a month per worker, of which they will give the worker $20. Wait a minute. We, we're paying $500 a month for this worker, and the worker only gets $20? That was the typical average kind of um, relationship. That didn't go over well uh, with foreign investors, who kind of like to you know, pay their own workers uh, a decent salary. Um, but in any event, um, oh, uh, they, they reauthorize private agricultural markets, so farmers can take excess output that uh, is over and above what the plan says they have to deliver to the state, if they have anything, and sell them in private markets at market-determined prices. 
Okay? There was also some distribution of land for peasants to grow things like tobacco and coffee um, and that kind of thing. So with all of those kinds of reforms, they managed to stop the free fall. Um, a little bit later on, say like 1994, 1995, uh, that's when they really start to crank up the private sector. Uh, the private restaurants called paladaris uh, begin in 1995. Um, they were highly regulated. For instance, a paladar could have no more than um, 12 seats. And they paid enormous taxes and were subjected to pretty much arbitrary inspections just about any time inspector wanted to come along and hold his hand out. And you get things like you know, driving people around, that kind of stuff. They, they, they issued a, a, a list, I think it, was, it started off with 140 occupations that were permitted. Right? If you were a professional, like um, a university professor or a lawyer or a doctor, you could not participate in the private sector as a lawyer or a doctor. Um, you, you could, you know, if you wanted to uh, be a waiter somewhere at a private restaurant, you, you could do that as long as the restaurant was owned by you <laughs> because nobody in the private sector was permitted to employ another person. These were all family enterprises. Another was the private houses where tourists could go and rent a room. Typically, the way that worked was uh, the going rate was $25 a night for a bed per person, which is a lot of money. I mean, that's the average monthly salary, $25. But of course, you know, you have to pay your expenses and you have to pay your taxes. The taxes were $250 a month. So you knew you had to fill that room at least 10 days of every month just to break even on your taxes. Right? So it was a very, very risky thing to do. But potentially, if you could fill that room every day of the month, you're going to make a lot of money by Cuban standards. Okay, so that was part of this uh, private sector. They, they, they issue more and more of these licenses, and, and that gets a lot of people excited, and, and the economy starts to grow. 1996, they almost achieve 8% growth year over year. Pretty decent, pretty decent, and then they put the brakes on it. The Castros get up there, and they start criticizing all of this and they in, increase the taxes um, a lot. They increase regulation a lot. They slash the number of, of um, licenses. And uh, the result was, well, you can see it, uh, 1997, the uh, growth rate was only 2.5%. 1998, 1.2%. This, this is in a developing country that is um, supposed to be recovering from a financial crisis, you, you want to see during this recovery much larger uh, growth rates, more like 8% than 2%. Uh, 1999 wasn't bad. Some of the um, um, it was good sugar prices that year. It was a, good, a decent harvest. Uh, some of these pr uh, foreign investments were coming in, um, and, and they, they're achieving fairly decent growth. Um, 2000, 5.6%, and then 2001. What happened in 2001? A couple of interesting things that might have an impact on Cuba. Well, it was 9-11. What do you suppose that impacted? Tourism, <laughs> big time. What else happened in 01? Recession. recession, the dot-com recession. That affected tourism. All right, so uh, Cuba starts to lose a lot of uh, revenue from the tourist industry. Um, what else happened? Uh, well, in October of that year, they got hit by the biggest hurricane since 1952. They had a lot more damage than this hurricane that this, uh, a few months ago. It almost destroyed the sugar industry. Um, the Russians were still there. The Russian military had a big listening post, listening <laughs> to the US, of course. Uh, this thing was enormous. They were paying Cuba $200 million a year just in rent to have this listening station. They pulled it out. They pulled it out. All right. 
Anybody who knows anything about the Cuban economy knows that Cuba did not achieve a 3% growth that year. Cuba is starting to cook the books. Right. You can trust all these years leading up to 01. Pretty much everybody agrees that Cuba was doing a good job. They would adopted the United Nations method of national income accounting. Um, they were doing it right. right? You, people pretty much trust those numbers. Anything that happens in 01 beyond is fantasy. Is fantasy. Uh, they did not achieve that growth in 01. Um, and of course, you know, in 02, it's 1% um, growth. Um, in 04, they abandoned the standard methodology of income accounting, national income accounting, and adopt their own method. So now you cannot even relate that to other countries or Cuba over time because they're using a different methodology to calculate gross domestic product. And in 05, they do a revision uh, uh, of the national income accounting for the healthcare industry and decide, oh, we got 80% increase in that one sector, which of course didn't happen. In 05, they achieve 11% growth. Um, this, this, was, this was a time when uh, sugar production went down, <laughs> prices of sugar went down, uh, nickel production went down, although prices went up. Um, it was not a good year. I mean, anybody who actually knows what was happening in Cuba knows this was not a good year, and yet they report 11%. The next year, they report 12%. I would have made Cuba the fastest growing economy in the world those two years. It didn't happen, of course. It didn't happen. Um, and what happens in 06? Fidel gets sick. Fidel's in the hospital. He hands the reins of power to his brother Raul, who's four years younger. Okay? But Fidel's still there for the next two years. Looking over Raul's shoulder. Raul's got to be careful. Raul's got to be careful. But he, he starts to institute a set of, of um, reforms, um, kind of administrative reforms. In other words, they don't really go to the, the meat of a socialist economy. It just had to do with certain rights that Cubans didn't have and they were irritated by it. So, for instance, Cubans were not permitted to book a, a hotel room in a tourist hotel, you know, a hotel for international tourism. They were not allowed to book a room. That made them second-class citizens to foreigners. They weren't allowed to have computers or cell phones, but foreigners could. You know, it, it, those are the kinds of things that um, Raul said, yeah, okay, you can do it. You can, you can book a room. Of course, you can't afford to book a room, but you can book a room. You can also buy a car. We'll let you buy a brand new car. So for instance, um, a bottom of the line Peugeot, which you could buy in Europe for $35,000, uh, would cost about $200,000 in Cuba. Uh, the markups were a little high. A little high. Um, so, but they had the right. Of course, when the Cubans went in there to the showrooms, they didn't really have showrooms, but you know, when they went into the office and looked at the price list, they were a little disappointed with this new right that they had, but that's the kind of uh, reforms that Raul instituted during this period when he was acting president, because Fidel had every intention of returning. So Raul is only acting president until 08. And then uh, Fidel says, okay, well, I'm obviously not coming back. Um, so the National Assembly uh, votes Raul to be president. That allows Raul to be a little bit more um, adventurous in his reforms. Um, and so he, he starts criticizing the Cuban economy. And he starts inviting people, everybody, to criticize. Now, you know, prior to that period, if you criticized anything, you, you know, you were sent to prison immediately. Raul was himself criticizing the economy, the political system, and inviting everybody to make their criticisms known. One of the things he said was, we have 
a one million worker redundancy in our economy. Right? We've got a million workers who aren't doing anything. They're not needed for any productive purpose. We've got to get rid of them. Well, there are only five million workers. So one out of every five worker in Cuba is, to use Raul's term, redundant. And it will be the policy of the state over a period of time to reduce that uh, state employment by a million workers. Well, it doesn't really happen. They were hoping that they would grow the private sector to absorb the laid off workers. This is a structural reform. Reducing the workforce in the state sector is a structure. This is, this is the structure of the socialist system we're talking about now, right? The big part of socialism is guaranteed employment. This is a promise of socialism. You will be employed. You don't have to worry about it. You will have a job. Raul is saying, we're going to lay off one of every five workers. You'd better go find a job in the private sector. He does things like closes down cafeterias in the factories, in the, the big enterprises. Well, this was a major source of food for Cuban workers. They were, he was closing them down. You know, this is part of the way the state provides their people. Okay? So this goes to the, the promises of socialism. Um, he's got to reduce the state budget. You know, they, they, it, it is really hard for Cuba to run a budget deficit. What, do you, what, what does a normal country do when it has a budget deficit? It borrows. All right? If they're spending more than their taxes are bringing in, they have to borrow the rest. All right? It's got to come from someplace. Cuba can't borrow. Nobody wants to lend to Cuba. It's too big a risk. So they have a really hard time running budget deficits. So one of the things they do is they reduce a lot of those promises of socialism, like free health care. Uh, the number of hospitals between 07 and 16 uh, went down by about a third mostly in rural areas. They closed down the rural hospitals and made patients go to regional hospitals far away. And transportation in Cuba is horrible. Um, total health personnel decreased 22% between 08 and 16. Family doctors, those famous family doctors that take care of everybody in Cuba, shrank 40%. Um, severe scarcity of medicines, um, uh, maternal mortality rose uh, 11%. Uh, education, primary enrollment went down 19%, 25% in rural schools. Secondary went down 15%, pre-university 32%. University enrollment went down 78% between 08 and 16. Now, in part, this is because the state was trying to save money. They were closing down universities. The other part was why would I want to get a university education if that means I become a, a doctor and make maybe 60, 70, 80 dollars a month when I could drive a taxi and make that in a day? <laughs> so who needs a, a, a university education? So it's kind of both demand side and uh, supply side there. This is an index of real wages with 1989 wages as the base. So that you know, takes the value of 100. This is that big collapse. Real wages went down 90% in just a few years. They've crept back up again so that they're about today 40% uh, of what they were in 1989. It's a big loss of income for the average Cuban. Um, pensions, average pensioner gets a pension that's about uh, half of what he would have gotten in 1989. Right, so this is real economic hardship in Cuba today. Even by their own system of national income accounting, um, they're, they're not doing well. All right? I mean, they could no longer uh, maintain this myth. I mean, nobody was believing them anyway. Their economy is becoming <laughs> stagnant. In 2016, they, they actually admitted to a recession.
They actually admit it to it. Um, they're claiming that in 17, they had about a 1% growth, but they're not giving out any real statistics on it. They're just asserting it. I don't think anybody believes it. They're still in recession. I'm pretty sure of that. This is the, um, the dependency ratio. This is the ratio of people 64 and older to people of working age, defined as 15 to 64. That's going up. What does that mean? That means fewer and fewer workers supporting more and more old people. Cuba is going into a demographic crisis. This is a time bomb. It's happening a lot of other places, too. You know, Japan's even worse. Right? Um, but this is going to be, this is something to look forward to in the future. How can H Cuba possibly uh, deal with this demographic crisis? People aren't having babies. Right? And so there are fewer and fewer workers. There's also immigration. People are leaving. People are leaving. Working age people are leaving Cuba one way or another. That's not helping their situation. Um, so, what is it? December of 2014, um, Barack Obama and Raul Castro make a simultaneous announcement in Havana and Washington of a partial normalization of uh, relations between the two countries. Right? The U.S. would reestablish their embassy. They had what was called a... Um, a, uh, a, 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 uh, an interest section. This was a part of the Swiss embassy uh, that took care of American, U.S. interests. It was by far the largest embassy in Havana during this whole time, um, but it wasn't really, it was part of the Swiss embassy, which the real Swiss embassy was a little house miles away. Um, that became the U.S. embassy. Okay, wow. People never thought they would see that. Um, Obama visits Cuba in March of 2016. I was there just a couple days after he left. Everybody, it was amazing. The T-shirts with the American flag on it, bathing suits with the American flag, cars driving around with American flags flying on the cars. I mean, it was a time of incredible excitement. Um, so what's happened uh, to relations between Cuba and the U.S. Uh, since that time? Well, one thing I can tell you, um, even before the Trump administration, um, trade with the U.S. has been is down. It's less now than it was then. And repression in Cuba is up. So this, these are trade statistics. Um, here's 2014, here's 2015. It's growing a little bit in the last uh, couple of years, but is not at the level it was in 2014. So trade between the U.S. and Cuba is down. There was a time, despite the embargo, where the U.S., this, was, this would have been in um, 08, I think, right before this starts, uh, where the U.S. was Cuba's fifth largest trading partner. This despite the fact that the U.S. imports nothing from Cuba. All right, so this ranking is based on exports plus imports. Our imports from Cuba are zero. Just based on our exports to Cuba, we were Cuba's fifth largest trading partner. What we were exporting to Cuba was chickens and wheat and rice, food. Under the embargo, the US, US farmers are allowed to sell their output to Cuba. It had to be on a cash basis, but it was permitted. Right? Since then, uh, uh, trade has come way down. This from Human Rights Watch. The Cuban government continues to repress dissent and discourage public criticism and now relies less on long-term prison sentences to punish its critics, but short-term arbitrary arrests of human rights defenders, independent journalists, and others have increased dramatically in recent years. Other repressive tactics employed by the government include beatings, public acts of shaming, and the termination of employment. So, uh, and now, of course, we go into the Trump period, and Trump is no friend of, of uh, Cuba. And um, I didn't teach my course on the Cuban economy this year, which I take students to Cuba, because the State Department issued a travel warning. With a travel warning, I can't take students to Cuba. Relations between the U.S. and Cuba are not real good today. 
and uh, are probably deteriorating. The Cuban economy is deteriorating. They're in recession. I don't see much hope for, um, for much of a recovery anytime soon because the Cuban state insists on maintaining such strong control of the private sector. Right now, what's going on is they, they have a list of occupations in which you are permitted to participate in the private sector. 201 occupations. It includes things like party clown. That's one of the 201, party clown. Um, driving these taxis, uh, renting a room out to tourists, uh, a restaurant. They're the pro they have, they have uh, several months ago, Raul said, OK, we're, we're going to stop giving out licenses. We're, we're going to stop licensing new entrepreneurs. We're shutting it all down. They, they have raided a bunch of restaurants on tax evasion charges and things like that, closed them down. Um, and now they're, they're, they're saying that they're working on a revision of the rules where they will reduce this list of 201 to like 150 or something like that. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to give licenses for broader definitions. So for instance, if you want to be a barber, you want to cut people's hair, well, you're going to get a license not just to be a barber to cut people's hair um, in an alleyway somewhere, but you're going to get a license to be a hairdresser and a cosmetologist and all sorts of other things that you don't want to do, but you're going to have to pay for now. Okay? So there's a real clamping down, once again, on the private sector, just as they need to free the, the private sector to do its own thing, to be productive, as it has proven itself able to do. All the economists in Cuba are saying the same thing. The Cuban economists say, you've got to free up this, these, these markets. And they're doing the exact opposite. Uh, so I'm not real optimistic. Um, obviously, this is a, a system that is not sustainable in the long run. But it has managed to sustain itself for a long time. <laughs> And it could bounce along for a while, I suppose. Uh, so I have no idea. But I'm pretty sure that in the long run, this is not a sustainable system. But, um, but that's the situation in Cuba today. Um, I've got a photo gallery of uh, pictures that I've been taking since my first trip to Cuba in 1998, which you can find at that address. Thank you very much.